Um, esters. Admittedly, these actually are a little bit more interesting than any of the others uh, in the carboxylic acid chapter because what we're looking at here is SENS. So like you guys kind of maybe discovered last week when we looked at uh, esters in lab, you could get scents. So a lot of the natural fruity scents that you smelled um, off of pretty much any fruit are coming from an ester compound. Uh, it just happens to be that that relative shape in chemistry coordinates well with something within our brains, and there we go. We get those scents associated with it. Um, esters, carboxylic acids, and amines, or the, sorry, the amides, all have kind of very similar-ish chemistry as far as equilibrium. So they are all very, very equilibrium dependent. Whereas when we looked at the anhydride and, let's see since they're up here, the anhydride and the acyl chloride, um, both of those were very unidirectional. And that's because that electrophile was so reactive that pretty much any nucleophile we put in there pushes completely uh, to products and we don't have to worry about it. With the uh, ester, and for most the acid isn't on this, the ester and the amine, or the amides, uh, that chemistry is very equilibrium dependent. Okay, so to get these reactions to actually generate products or to generate your ester or to generate the amide, we have to take advantage of concentration gradients and really try and push the reaction one way or the other. Okay? So realize with, with these or these last few, we're looking at lots of equilibrium issues showing up. Okay? So in this overall reaction, uh, it is highly equilibrium based. It does go both backwards and forwards. Um, so we don't see a huge favoring necessarily for the ester. In general, the ester is favored ever so slightly, but not by much. Okay? So if you remember your equilibrium constants, anybody remember your equilibrium constants? That capital K, which is equal to, <laughs> slow shaking of head, that's always a good sign. Concentration of products over the concentration of reactants. Okay? The bigger your K value, the more your products were favored. The smaller the K value, the more your reactants were favored. Ester reactions typically have K values on the four to five, maybe as big as 10, okay, as far as a number goes. So that is relatively small. You're looking at something that does favor the ester formation, but very, very minute, or very, very minutely. So how can we take advantage of Le Chatelier's principle to help actually make our ester? Dry it. Okay, what we can try and do is dry it, and by dry it you mean? Take out the uh, water. We can try and remove water. Okay. So in the course of the experiment, we would try and remove water. If we can remove the product, we can force product, more for product formation. What else could we do? Kind of, sort of. What does adding the catalyst do? Speeds the reaction. It does not get you more products. It gets you to that st set concentration of products faster, but it doesn't give you more products. Okay, so you will typically see most ester reactions run with a catalyst, and that's because it's a relatively slow reaction. So we add the catalyst to speed up the mechanism to get us to our products faster, but it's going to speed the reverse reaction just as much. Okay, so it's not going to favor products. Can you say that again? Okay. We could change the leaving group to be better, but then ultimately what we've done is we're no longer reacting uh, a carboxylic acid across. So we could go back and change that to an acyl chloride or the acetic anhydride. Both of those would do your ester formation very, very rapidly. Okay. Um, kind of, sort of trying to sneak out of that by saying we're now stuck with the carboxylic acid. So you're right. Changing the leaving group definitely helps this reaction along, but in the process of doing that, you no longer are doing a Fischer esterification. Okay. Um, so if we're going to try and maintain the Fischer esterification, we could try and change the strength of the nucleophile. There's a reasonable idea. Um, problem with that is that by increasing the strength of the nucleophile, what charge would our oxygen become on our nucleophile? We'd have a negative charge, right? 
which means our nucleophile is both a nucleophile and a base. Where's the most positive atom in our other material? Hydrogen. The hydrogen. So what happens? Our base comes along and pulls off our hydrogen. You didn't like the hydroxide being a leaving group, and you already tried to change that, so that's a good idea. Okay. What happened if we now make our base more nu or our nucleophile more nucleophilic? It becomes basic, and it took a bad leaving group and made it worse. Okay. So we typically won't see base catalyst in these reactions because that's going to make your leaving group even worse. Okay. This goes back, or the last possible suggestion for how we can make this reaction favor our products goes back to Le Chatelier's principle. We can remove products or we can add one of our reactants. Okay? Typically, we add more of the, the nucleophile or our alcohol. Uh, in lab, for some reason, we added the acid. I've always seen it with more of the alcohol, so I don't know why the lab procedures had to add more of the acid. It seems a bit suspicious to me. Um, and we, saw, we all saw how well that lab worked, too. So maybe we should have doubled the alcohol instead. Okay? So what we can do is increase the concentration of one of our reagents. That'll help shift our equilibrium towards our products. Okay. Um, we, won't that either. we could go through and look at a general mechanism. Hopefully you guys are comfortable with the mechanisms now for your carbonyls. Is that a yes? That's a yes. OK. Um, lots of proton transfers. It's a rather long mechanism, but ultimately all you end up doing is swapping uh, that OR group for the OH. Okay? Uh, if we're going to consider and going all the way back to our original reaction here, if we want our ester to form, ultimately all we're saying is that's an R. If we want a lot of the ester, we need to put in a lot of the OR and keep the OH minimal because right, those are the two pieces we're exchanging. If we want a lot of the acid, okay, the carboxylic acid, what do we need to minimize? Right, what we'd be looking at is now going the reverse direction. What do we want to minimize the presence of? Our alcohol, our O-methyl, and we want to maximize the presence of our water, okay? the OH that we want to put onto it. Okay. So the idea is to try and just look at what direction you're trying to do. And in these cases, you just push the equilibrium by throwing more of either the OR or the OH in, depending on which way you're trying to go. So if you want the carboxylic acid, we want a lot of water, or our OH. If we want the ester, we want a lot of the alcohol, put in our OR. Okay? And that's going to be our primary driving force to push it one direction or the other. Without that, all we're really looking at is it going back and forth in equilibrium, and it's kind of boring. Okay? So all of our mechanistic steps. Fun, fun, fun. And we now have our ester. Um, so the other method, which you were referring to, is that we could go through, instead of starting with something very, very mild as a reactive uh, reagent, we could up the electrophilicity of our uh, carbonyl carbon, okay? And we can do that by changing the leaving group, okay? Because apparently this chemistry is so boring or so easy, um, everybody discovered it, so nobody got to name it. Whereas that last one, that was so much more difficult, so Fisher got to attach his name to it. Um, why do we need pyridine? Why do we need a base? You're absolutely right. To, to decarbonate the, uh, the natural products. Our alcohol has that hydrogen on it. We need to get rid of that hydrogen okay, at some point to get to our final product. So that very last step of our mechanism is probably going to be removing the hydrogen and taking us to our final ester. So when we're reacting with our acyl chlorides, we typically throw in that pyridine uh, to help remove that last hydrogen. Okay. Um, why does it not act as a nucleophile? Sterically hindered. Okay. Um, 
probably something you will need to know. We will talk about it in the amine chapter. But when we look at pyridine, back to the benzene ring, with that nitrogen lone pair, that lone pair on the nitrogen is what can act as our base. Okay? Not very nucleophilic um, because it is sterically hindered by that ring. Fairly large ring blocks it further for it to go pick up and attach with a ring. We're trying to sh really, really share those electrons, which isn't going to be the easiest thing on the planet because our nitrogen becomes positively charged. The nice thing about sharing with a hydrogen is what can we do with the hydrogen? We can take it off just as easily as we can put it on. Okay, our acid base chemistry is relatively easy. Okay. So our pyridine won't act as a nucleophile due to that steric hindrance. Um, we can also go through a saponification reaction. So notice when we went through from the acid to the ester, we said base conditions were a bad idea. If we're going to do the reverse, and we're going to go from the ester to the acid, base conditions are actually OK. Right? And the reason being comes from how that reaction is going to work. Our base, we want to be a good nucleophile. Right? And in the previous case, we said it was bad to use a strong nucleophile or base because that would remove a hydrogen from our leaving group. Do we have a hydrogen on that leaving group? Nope, because we're starting with the ester. Okay. So one of the reactions we can do with our esters once we actually have them is react them with strong nucleophiles. Um, we can hit basic conditions without having to stress about that secondary reaction. Okay. This is most commonly known as saponification. It's what we did in lab when we made soap. Okay. So you can take any kind of ester uh, and put it under base conditions, and you can regenerate. Uh, it won't actually be the carboxylic acid. Why might it not be the carboxylic acid as our final product in a saponification reaction? It's a little bit of a trickier question. Let's try and write out an overall reaction. We're starting with our ester, and we're adding OH minus, right? Our goal is to ultimately convert this into our carboxylic acid and a leaving group, right? Anybody see any issues at this stage? What's that issue? What's the issue with the OH? Change your wording around. Uh, I th oh, I see what you're saying now. Um, we could go through and say our basic conditions, the OH, will pull off the hydrogen. Where I was actually fishing for was to have you use the OR, but. You're right, if we're under basic conditions, we still have OH. Okay. And what we would actually end up with is the carboxylate salt. 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 Okay. Why do we refer to it as the carboxylate? Anybody remember how you named the piece? It's the O8. So when we refer to it, we're looking at the carboxylate because of that 8 ending, it's the derivative of our carboxylic acid. Um, why does this work well for soaps? Particularly if we add a whole bunch of carbons out the other end. You have a highly polar end, and a carbon may not polar. We have a very polar head group, much more polar than if we turned it into the acid. Why? You have a negative charge. We have that ionic charge. Okay. So we have that polar head with that ionic charge, and then we also have that very nonpolar tail. Allows it to interact uh, with both polar and nonpolar compounds fairly equally, which is good when we're looking at soap. We want to be able to have soap take dirt and grease off of our skin by using water. We could use something like benzene. That would work really well, too. The problem with benzene is it's toxic. Okay. Um, so that's our saponification reaction. So it's made the reverse of our esterification. Okay. Um, just like we could go through and react it with an oxygen, we could react it with a nitrogen. Um, these are a little bit less reversible. Why might these be a little bit less reversible than the uh, 
ester reactions or the ester formations. When we look at our ester reaction, it's an oxygen leaving group and an oxygen nucleophile. What's the case when we're looking at the formation of our amines or amines? We have a nitrogen nucleophile instead of the oxygen, and as you were trying to say there, as I interrupted you, nitrogen is, you don't want to finish it again? A better nucleophile. A better nucleophile than our oxygen, so we tend to see a larger favoring for the amide functional group. Okay. How much larger? It's enough that we would generate a reasonable amount, um, but we're still probably going to put some Le Chatelier type limitations on that. So we'll probably put in a lot of the nitrogen nucleophile, and we'll probably also try as best we can to remove as much of that alcohol, or if we had reacted it with a carboxylic acid, the water as it was formed. Okay? Um, and as they're starting to list at the bottom, it's relatively slow. Okay? So if we wanted to actually form an amide, we'd come up with other ways to do it, like probably starting with a better electrophile, going up to the acyl chlorides or the uh, anhydrides. Um, we can also react it with hydrogen nucleophiles, so we can react away our carbonyl using our lithium aluminum hydride. Uh, lithium aluminum hydride, remember, is a good source of hydride, which is a good reducing agent. We can take our ester all the way down to uh, an alcohol using the hydride. Right, just like we've seen with pretty much every other um, carbonyl compound. We do need two equivalents. Why do we need two equivalents? It's two reductive steps. We start with three oxygen bonds and we end with one. So if we're going to go through and actually do this full reducing, we need to get rid of both of those uh, oxygen bonds by replacing them with hydrogens. Okay. You guys want to see a mechanism? Okay. Um, if, however, we want to stop and not go all the way to the alcohol, I'm pretty sure we've already, did we already talk about this one? Okay. Um, we may have talked about it with the acyl chlorides, trying to stop at the uh, aldehyde. We'd want to put in a bulky hydride supplier. Okay. This reagent might look familiar if you remember all the way back to one of those quizzes. Okay. Um, diisobutyl uh, aluminum hydride. Okay. It is a bulky reducing agent. It does supply the hydride, but it adds a whole bunch of steric blocking. So we do get the hydride, but then we get a bunch of junk as our steric blockers that can then prevent that reagent from reacting with the aldehyde. Okay. So we end up stalling out at the aldehyde. We've now done our reduction might make a little bit more sense in this case than we did in previous situations because here we're actually starting with something that's a lot of a milder uh, electrophile. Our carbonyl is a little bit more stable than, say, the acyl chloride. Okay. We could also go through and do Grignard reagents. Um, you guys have seen this, so I was planning on just kind of saying you'd seen it and being happy with it. Questions about your ester reactions with Grignards? Should I draw one out? Seeing some kind of head shakes. So if we start with an ester, let's say O-methyl, and we react this with a Grignard reagent, let's go ahead and call it, well, let's just do CH3. What does the Grignard reagent supply? A strong carbon nucleophile. What is that nucleophile going to attack? Our carbonyl carbon. We can break the pi bond. Since it's relatively early, I'll go ahead and draw out our tetrahedral intermediate. And we'd have our CH3. If you wanted to get real fancy with the balancing, 
you might see the magnesium bromide drawn up near the oxygen. Why would you draw it near the oxygen? Okay, we're looking at that positive negative stabilization. Okay, relatively. That carbon, our central carbon, still effectively has what I would call three electronegative elements attached to it. It's a little bit weird to refer to our carbon that just attached as electronegative, but remember it came in as a negative as well. Okay? So that central carbon kind of panics a little bit. Our pi electrons come back down, and we can kick out our O-methyl. The result... Since I had it color-coded, we've got our CH3, and we have O-methyl. How good of a leaving group is that? It's better than oxygen. It's better than just straight oxygen, yeah. It's a pretty horrible leaving group. Why would this mechanism work? What's it going into a solution of? something that's an even worse leaving group. All right. That oxygen would rather hold the electron density than the carbon. Our carbon will definitely go through and push this reaction and push that negative oxygen out. Even though it's a bad leaving group, it is better than the environment that's already there. All right. What functional group do we have? We've got the ketone. What did we start with? Ester. We started with an ester. In all reactions, we're reacting more than just one molecule at an individual time. So if we start with more of these, let's say two of our ester and two of our Grignard, okay, what happens after one reaction? I've got a ketone and ester left over and the, carb and the Grignard. So the Grignard now gets to decide what does it react with, the ketone or the ester. They both have an electrophilic carbon. Okay, with that carbonyl, which one is more electrophilic? The ketone, and the ketone's more electrophilic because... What's that? You're not going to get a lot of steric hindrance. You will see resonance. Resonance from our ester oxygen can stabilize uh, the electrophilic carbon. That limits the reactivity of the ester, so our Grignard reacts preferentially with the ketone. Okay? So if we were going to run just a mixture of one-to-one, -one, our ester and our Grignard reagent, what we'd end up seeing is no carbonyl at the very end, and we'd still have leftover ester, okay? because some of it just didn't react. So if you're really trying to react your ester entirely with a Grignard reagent, you will need two equivalents, because the Grignard will need to react twice with the ester. I realize you will never isolate the ketone when reacting esters with Grignards. Why? Because the ketone was more reactive than the ester. So as soon as we make the ketone, it immediately reacts. You can't get that ketone isolated. Okay. Questions about the esters? I know those were thoroughly exciting. Okay. So now what we're going to do is actually move into something that I would argue is probably more biologically relevant for pretty much where everybody wants to go. Uh, when you're looking at biochemistry, the amide functional group is a massively important functional group to look at. Why might it be important? I just drawn? We have an amino acid. Why is that relevant? What happens when I link amino acids near each other? Proteins. I get proteins. What's the bond that I just formed between those two amino acids? It's an amide bond. Okay. Those of you that have to take biochemistry, you end up 
referencing that bond in a lot of the chemistry around the carboxylic acid and the amine, a lot, okay? Because your body has to process, or all biochemistry has to process these different types of linkages, okay? It's also a very important type of bond when it comes to synthetic chemistry. Uh, anybody recognize the compound that's actually made? They got drawn up on the screen there. Anybody recognize what it's from? Why do they call it nylon? Have you seen nylon before? It's a common fabric found in clothing and in other uh, fishing line, I think is nylon. Uh, it's a very common polymer, synthetic polymer, um, made originally by Carruthers, I think was his name. All sorts of little fun stories swirling about how he discovered that. Okay, so polymer formation, not just in amino acids, but then also our synthetic polymers usually come back to amide linkages because they're relatively easy to make and we can actually keep these things separate and control that reaction a lot better than we can control some of our other reactions. Okay. Has anybody made nylon before? First semester. First semester you made it? Oh, wow. It's a big jump. Nobody else? Well, we can real briefly mention it just because it's kind of neat. You can take a beaker, and one of the things that you'll take advantage of is that your acid halide, um, let's see if I remember this correctly. You will dissolve this in an organic solvent, and you can dissolve the amine in an aqueous solvent. Why would the amine dissolve in an aqueous solvent? got a lot of hydrogen bonding on those ends. It does have a lot of nonpolar interactions through it, but I'm pretty sure you can get it to dissolve in water. Why would we not dissolve the diacid in water? Water's a really good nucleophile. We've got that diacid is an extremely good electrophile. The water reacts with it and neutralizes the reactivity. We want to take advantage of that chemistry in this. What can we do with two, with two layers, an organic and an aqueous? do is end up stacking them. Okay. The hope with this reaction is now that they're in two separate phases is the only place that the amine can react with the acid is where? What's that? Right where they touch, right in between. So what you can do is get a little bit of copper. Usually it's copper wire or something like that. Make a little loop. You can break through the skin of that surface, and as you pull it out, you can twist it a little bit, and that will catch the polymer surface on your copper. Then what you can do is continue to slowly pull it out. As you pull it out, you end up removing polymer. What does that do on the sides? If I take something out of the middle, what happens to the edges? They shrink inwards, which means what's now exposed on those two sides? Fresh acid, fresh amine, which now means the polymer reaction can occur again, and you can continue to pull, and as you continue to pull, more polymer can form up on the sides, and you can end up pulling a thread of nylon out of the middle of, out of the reaction. So it's kind of a neat reaction to go through and watch. Kind of boring as far as polymer chemistry goes, because we never ever teach you polymer chemistry. Uh, allegedly, that's how Carruthers discovered it. He mixed the two chemicals in these two different phases and for some reason forgot about it and came back the next day and was like, oh, crap, I'm going to just stir it up and just throw it away. And so he stuck his stir rod into it, swirled a little bit, and noticed something got all weird and cloudy. So instead of quickly stirring it some more because he didn't know what's going on, he pulled the stir rod out. And as he pulled it out, guess what happened? Nylon came out with it. And he thought it was so cool, he started running around the lab with this big nylon strand chasing him around the lab stuck to a stir rod. Uh, if you ever do get to make it, it's not that durable. <laughs> okay. um, but a lot of polymer chemistry, again, comes back to these kind of quick, easy linkages. Um, and we can continue to react this outwards because we have a free amine on one side and we have the free uh, acid on the other. Okay. So kind of a, our fun story for the day, allegedly fun. Uh, <clears throat> the reactions with our amides. We can go through and hydrolyze our amides. 
okay? Um, would we expect this reaction to be an easy reaction to run? All right, so what are we exchanging? We're exchanging the oxygen, or sorry, the nitrogen for our oxygen. Would we expect that to be an easy reaction? Why not? Which is the better nucleophile? Nitrogen. What are we trying to do? We're trying to put in oxygen as a nucleophile. Okay, is that going to be a favorable interaction? Probably not. To go through and actually facilitate this, we will have to add in a sizable amount of acid. Okay, the reason being is that if we can protonate that nitrogen, let's say we put an extra hydrogen on there instead of that lone pair, what charge does that nitrogen become? Positive. Now, is it a reasonable leaving group? Yeah, it doesn't want to be positive, so it could leave. But then we would get NH3 with that lone pair. What's the problem with that lone pair? It's nucleophilic, so what do we need to do? If we're under acidic conditions, we can put yet another hydrogen on there. Can it act as a nucleophile anymore? Nope, because it no longer has that lone pair. All right. So to go through and do the hydrolysis, we really need to have that acid to neutralize uh, that nucleophilic effect of our nitrogen. Okay. So that's why we have to drive with that acid. Where does the NH4 come from ultimately? It's coming from neutralizing that nucleophile. So when we initially form our carboxylic acid, uh, or you could even say at a later stage, uh, the acid is going to protonate that amine leaving group, and we won't have to worry about it acting as a nucleophile. Which brings up, yet again, more issues with your amines. If you've got a nitrogen floating around in solution, you need to make sure that you limit its reactivity. Okay? If you're under acidic conditions, we will never form NH3. Okay? Because NH3 is... What's special about NH3? It's a base. So if we're under acidic conditions, can we make NH3? No. Okay, so you're going to have to watch out for whether you're running under acidic or basic conditions because that's going to impact greatly what products you end up making in it. Okay? Sapling is allegedly hopefully putting together a couple uh, assignments, and I've noticed for sure they ask about the amine. Okay, so watch out for that nitrogen. It does need to be positive if you're running under acidic conditions. Okay. Oh, just like with all our other ones, we can go through and now react it with all of our other possible nucleophiles. So in this case, we can go through and react with our hydride, um, and we end up with a primary amine. Why do we not end up with the alcohol? When we reacted our esters or our acids with our lithium aluminum hydride, we got the alcohol. Why did we get the amine? So we drew up an example ester up top. Why do we get the amine? What are the two groups that have the potential of getting kicked out? And either the ester or the amide. The ester is a little bit easier. What groups need to get kicked out? the oxygen, and we also need to break another oxygen bond, right? What happens when we look at the ester? Sorry, that's not an ester anymore. That's the amide. What are our groups now? 
nitrogen and oxygen. Why would we preferentially kick out only the oxygen and not the nitrogen? Nitrogen is a better nucleophile, which means given the decision, which one would rather leave with the electrons? Oxygen being more electronegative. So we end up with the primary amine instead of the alcohol when we react our amides, and it still goes back to that same silly chemistry. Our nitrogen is lower in electronegativity. It's rather going to stay attached to our structure, okay, given that option. Okay. You can go through and look at the mechanism both in the textbook and I think um, what they're trying to show through up there as well. Okay. Uh, the nitrogen is just going to, would rather stay attached to the structure. Our oxygen would rather take its electrons and leave because it's a worse nucleophile. Okay. We're better leaving group. This goes through and shows each of the mechanistic steps. The important one that we just mentioned is that very first step. Okay. The nitrogen putting in its electrons uh, instead of the oxygen. Okay. So the intermediate that we end up forming is actually known as what functional group, sort of? That intermediate. You guys vaguely remember that one? Very similar to an amine. Or I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean. Let's stick with I mean. Okay, because um, we've got that primary nitrogen. Okay, with the double bonds. Okay. Um, ultimately, what you need to remember: lithium aluminum hydride takes you to the amine. Okay. Uh, last section that we'd have to look at within this chapter is the reactivity of your nitriles. Why did we say the nitriles were grouped best within this chapter? What do you remember? This is your acid chapter, right? So it's a carbonyl with an extra hetero atom. Why do our nitriles seem to fit pretty well in this chapter? We still have a carbon bound to three electronegative atoms, they just happen to be in the exact same atom. Okay? So the chemistry happens to overlap fairly similarly as far as how these things end up working out. Okay? So you can go ahead and put the nitrile on because cyanide is a good leaving group, so we can run a substitution reaction to get the nitrile attached to the ring. Okay? We can also go through and make that by dehydrating in amide. Uh, the thionyl chloride happens to be the only one that we're going to talk about. Uh, I think that's kind of an interesting mechanism. So just for the heck of it, right? We'll turn that into a quiz and let you guys work on trying to figure out how to make that come up with them. So our reactions of nitriles, we can react them with oxygen nucleophiles. In the case of reacting with an oxygen nucleophile, ultimately what we're doing is the reverse of what we just did. Okay? Um, and we can take it back to the amide. If we add more acid and more water, we can actually push it all the way to the carboxylic acid. And that's because our amides are in equilibrium with water as well and carboxylic acids. So we could actually push it all the way back to the carboxylic acid if we wanted from the nitrile. Okay? We could also do this in the presence of a base. The base would help facilitate a lot of that, um, probably make it easier to see the deprotonations along that way or along your way. Okay? <coughs> Um, they're still really good with Grignards. I remember your carbon in your uh, nitrile is a good electrophile, so our Grignard reagent can attack that position. Uh, and then if we so chose, we could put it under acid conditions and turn it into the carbonyl. Okay? So kind of a neat reaction there. Oh, I thought I saw something I wanted to talk about. Um, oh, I did How do we make our cyanide or our nitrile? Does that give you a hint? We just saw that a few slides ago. Start with an alkyl halide and react it with whoops. We could react it with our carbon and nitrogen. 
Which atom is our nucleophile, the carbon or the nitrogen? The carbon is our nucleophile. Interesting. What happens to the carbon when we look at its reactivity after it's attached? It becomes... What do you mean non-existent? It's right there. <laughs> it's now an electrophile. Okay? So when the process of dealing with our nitriles, be aware that you can see the chemistry shift around. When we have it as our cyanide and we try and put the nitrile onto our carbon structure, the carbon acts as a nucleophile. As soon as it's now attached to another carbon, the chemistry drastically changes and we now see it acting as an electrophile. So we see a big shift in the chemistry when we're looking at our cyanide versus our nitriles. Okay. Um, hydrogen nucleophiles, we can again go through and reduce with our lithium aluminum hydride. Same kind of idea as before. Our lithium aluminum hydride just likes to react uh, with polar pi bonds. Our polar pi bond in this case just happens to be with the nitrogen as opposed to the carbon uh, carbonyls. Okay. Your synthetic strategies good idea to kind of get a feel for what's happening on this slide. What we're doing is trying to interconvert between all of these possible situations. I know it looks a, a bit confusing, and I was hoping I was going to be able to put together something better, but this is all we got. Okay? So what we're looking at trying to do is convert between our acids and ultimately go to each of these individual functional groups and then see how we can shuttle around to different species along the way. Okay. This is something directly out of your textbook, so it should be helpful as a reference when trying to approach your carbonyl chemistry reactions. Ultimately, what are we referring to? Our carbonyl carbon in all of these cases acts as an electrophile, and we're going to react it with some kind of nucleophile. Okay. The one real exception to that, thionyl chloride. Thionyl chloride is acting as the electrophile. Okay? So that one's kind of multi purpose as far as its chemistry. It shows up all over the place or shows up in at least two different places, um, reacting with our nitriles and with our carboxylic acids. Um, but then further, it's important because it acts as an electrophile, not as a nucleophile, as we saw with all the other reactions. Okay? So kind of neat as far as that reagent goes. Try and identify what types of things are occurring. So your textbook does a pretty good job of trying to shift what things are changing throughout the structure and trying to match that up as best you can. Uh, spectroscopy for your acids. Your carbonyl shows up at 1700. That is about all I would remember. Your textbook does go through and list off. You can see how it changes for each of these different uh, functional groups. While that is perfectly valid, the difference between 1800 and, say, 1760 is something that is relatively small. If you take a look at the ECS test, I'm pretty sure they don't actually give you the numbers on the individual signals either. So if you're going to try and interpret an 1800 signal versus a 1760 on a spectrum that is probably only two inches wide, that's going to be a bit of a challenge. Okay? So try to nail down the bulk idea behind it and hope for the best after that. Why does it change? Why does the acyl chloride show up at 1800, but the amide show up at 1660? That's a trickier question. Probably one that the ACS test could ask you, actually. Um, if you can push a further explanation with that, I might accept that. I don't quite understand your shielding effect. Because of how many electrons are there in one? Yeah. Because of how many electrons are there in one? Okay. I can agree with chlorine being more electronegative, and that is absolutely going to contribute to this. But I'm not quite seeing the shielding. Shielding is something we talk about typically in NMR. <laughs> Chlorine is more electronegative, so it draws electron density away, right? What is that going to do to the strength of that double bond? Make it a stronger double bond or a weaker double bond? Let's push it all away. Let's just push that to the extreme. 
let's say that chlorine completely takes the electrons away. What is that going to do to the strength of the bond? And if, if it weakens it, what we're saying is we're taking some of that electron density and we're removing it, making it closer to a, pi, a single bond. Is it doing that? Why is it strengthening it? No, don't quite accept that one. The carbon is electron deficient, so it wants to hold on to what it has more strongly. And it can accept more electrons from the oxygen to form. Come on, favorite ion. We've got the acillium ion. Okay, why is that important? We just converted that double bond between a carbon and an oxygen into a triple bond. Where do triple bonds show up? 2250. So if our carbonyl shows up at 1700 and we're now starting to make it look like a triple bond, where would we expect our number to shift to? Closer to the 2250 or further away? Closer. So we do see that shift towards that stronger bond. Right? We're putting more electrons actually in that bond space because the carbon has now become electron deficient. What happens when we look at our amide? So now we don't have an inductive effect. We actually have a more, everybody's favorite word. We have a resonance effect. What does that resonance effect do to the carbon-oxygen double bond? You want to try it? No. Okay. It weakens it. Okay. What we can do is push the electrons from the nitrogen in towards that carbon. We can now weaken that carbon-oxygen bond, which means we start to make that pi bond look more like a single bond. Where does the carbon-oxygen single bond show up? That one's harder. If you guys are really good with IR, then maybe you know that one. The fingerprint region? Actually, that's good enough. Fingerprint region, bigger or smaller than our 1700? Small. Smaller. So what happens if we put a resonance effect on our carbonyl? We would expect to see it get to smaller frequencies because it's starting to come approximate closer, that carbon-oxygen single bond. So what we're seeing is how resonance can affect our characteristics of our bonds. Okay? So kind of a neat effect with, within IR. Secondary effect, when you, see a car, uh, when you see a peak anywhere probably between 1800 and say 1650, you should be thinking carbonyl, okay? and leave it at that. How would you identify that it was a carboxylic acid then? You'd also see the OH with the carbonyl. How would you identify that it was, say, a ketone? Kind of be SOL on that one. You don't really have any other options. It's just the carbonyl. Okay. If it was the amide, what would we expect to see? If it was a primary amide, we'd expect to see that nitrogen-hydrogen stretch show up. Okay. So don't rely solely on a single one of these values. Try and spread it over multiple pieces. Remember, IR gives you bond information, not functional. Okay. Despite what anybody else may have told you. Okay. Um, I think this is the last slide, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, what we're looking at is just a summary of our spectroscopy. Um, because this is officially the carboxylic acid chapter, your OH stretch will show up. If you're looking at that 25 to 3300 inverse centimeters, you'll notice that is a little bit smaller than your standard alcohol. Why might it be smaller? What happened to the strength of the bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen? In the acid versus an alcohol. weaker. That's why it's an acid, right? It can give up H+. Plus. If we get a weaker bond, what happens to the frequency? Smaller numbers. So when we're looking at our carboxylic acid OH stretches, those show up at lower frequencies. We're looking at that 2,500 to 3,000 range. Typically what that does is just make a giant mess of that whole uh, carbon-hydrogen stretch range. Okay? So you just see a big, broad, nasty mess. Uh, your carbon-nitrogen triple bonds, pretty much any triple bond, 
shows up at that 2200 range, maybe as high as 2250. I think I usually center it around there. So you're looking at plus or minus maybe 100, so 2150 up to 2350. Um, that is the only thing that shows up in, your, in that range is the triple bond. Okay? Could be a triple bond to a carbon, so be careful with that. When you're looking at NMR, your carbon NMR, you've got the carbonyl stretch. Doesn't really show much differently than a standard carbonyl okay, from a ketone or an aldehyde. It's kind of falling in that same range. Um, your nitrile carbon peaks, you'll notice I didn't put that in colors because I don't have that one memorized, and I think that's in a, a very bad range to look at, actually. Too many other things show up there. Your hydrogen NMR, we will see that hydrogen typically showing up about 12 ppms. Uh, in most cases, that signal is virtually invisible. Okay? That peak ends up getting so, so small that we usually don't see it with, uh, over our background. Why might it be really, really small? Kind of a tricky question. What does HNMR identify? Hydrogen is attached to our larger structure. If we look at a carboxylic acid, what happens to our hydrogen? Is it attached to the structure very often? Nope, because it's acidic. So what happens? That hydrogen is now in varying stages of leaving the structure, which means when we look at it in the HNMR, it has a whole bunch of different chemical shifts. So every single carboxylic acid functional group has a slightly different hydrogen shift. Okay, well, what does that end up doing? Instead of our peak now being very sharp, it's very broad. So typically, your carboxylic acid hydrogen stretches get so broad that we actually don't see them above the baseline. Okay, the only way that you can usually identify them is by zooming in at what appears to be a flat line and say, oh, yeah, there is an actual peak there. Okay. So kind of a neat effect with your carboxylic acids. Okay? Uh, kind of depends on what you're looking at. Sometimes they'll show you that. Sometimes they'll make it more ideal and show you an actual signal at 12. If you see that signal at 12, you're looking at a carboxylic acid. Okay? Fairly characteristic. Hallelujah.